Chapter sixty one of Vanity Fair by William Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter sixty one in which two lights are put out. There came a day when the round of decorous pleasures and solemn gaieties in which Mr. Jos Sedley's family indulged was interrupted by an event which happens in most houses. As you ascend the staircase of your house from the drawing towards the bedroom floors, you may have remarked a little arch in the wall right before you, which at once gives light to the stair which leads from the second story to the third, where the nursery and servants' chambers commonly are, and serves for another purpose of utility, of which the undertaker's men can give you a notion. They rest the coffins upon that arch, or pass them through it so as not to disturb in any unseemly manner the cold tenant slumbering within the black ark. That second-floor arch in a London house, looking up and down the well of the staircase and commanding the main thoroughfare by which the inhabitants are passing, by which the cook lurks down before daylight to scour her pots and pans in the kitchen, by which young master stealthily ascends, having left his boots in the hall, and lets himself in after dawn from a jolly night at the club, down which miss comes rustling in fresh ribbons and spreading muslins, brilliant and beautiful, and prepared for conquest and the ball, or Master Tommy slides, preferring the banisters for a mode of conveyance, and disdaining danger and the stare, down which the mother is fondly carried, smiling in her strong husband's arms, as he steps steadily step by step and followed by the monthly nurse on the day when the medical man has pronounced that the charming patient may go downstairs up which john lurks to bed yawning with a sputtering tallow candle and to gather up before sunrise the boots which are awaiting him in the passages that stair up or down which babies are carried old people are helped guests are marshalled to the ball, the parson walks to the christening, the doctor to the sick-room, and the undertaker's men to the upper floor. What a memento of life, death, and vanity it is, that arch and stair, if you choose to consider it, and sit on the landing, looking up and down the well. The doctor will come up to us, too, for the last time, there, my friend in Motley the nurse will look in at the curtains, and you take no notice, and then she will fling open the windows for a little and let in the air. Then they will pull down all the front blinds of the house and live in the back rooms. Then they will send for the lawyer and other men in black, etc. Your comedy and mine will have been played then, and we shall be removed. Oh, how far from the trumpets and the shouting and the posture-making! If we are gentlefolks, they will put hatchments over our late domicile, with gilt cherubim, and mottoes stating that there is quiet in heaven. Your son will new furnish the house, or perhaps let it, and go into a more modern quarter. Your name will be among the members deceased in the lists of your clubs next year. However much you may be mourned, your widow will like to have her weeds neatly made, the cook will send or come up to ask about dinner. The survivor will soon bear to look at your picture over the mantelpiece, which will presently be deposed from the place of honour to make way for the portrait of the son who reigns. Which of the dead are most tenderly and passionately deplored? Those who love the survivors the least, I believe. The death of a child occasions a passion of grief and frantic tears such as your end brother reader will never inspire the death of an infant which scarce knew you which a week's absence from you would have caused to forget you will strike you down more than the loss of your closest friend or your first-born son a man grown like yourself with children of his own we may be harsh and stern with judah and simeon our love and pity gush out for benjamin the little one and if you are old, as some reader of this may be or shall be, old and rich or old and poor, you may one day be thinking for yourself, 
these people are very good round about me but they won't grieve me too much when i am gone i am very rich and they want my inheritance or very poor and they are tired of supporting me the period of mourning for mrs sedley's death was only just concluded and jos scarcely had had time to cast off his black and appear in the splendid waistcoats which he loved when it became evident to those about mr sedley that another event was at hand and that the old man was about to go seek for his wife in the dark land whither she had preceded him the state of my father's health jos sedley solemnly remarked at the club prevents me from giving any large parties this season but if you will come in quietly at half-past six chutney my boy and fake a homely dinner with one or two of the old set i shall be always glad to see you so jos and his acquaintances dined and drank their claret among themselves in silence whilst the sands of life were running out in the old man's glass upstairs the velvet-footed butler brought them their wine and they composed themselves to a rubber after dinner at which major dobbin would sometimes come and take a hand and mrs osborne would occasionally descend when her patient above was settled for the night and had commenced one of those lightly troubled slumbers which visit the pillow of old age the old man clung to his daughter during this sickness he would take his broths and medicines from scarcely any other hand to tend him became almost the sole business of her life her bed was placed close by the door which opened into his chamber and she was alive at the slightest noise or disturbance from the couch of the querulous invalid though to do him justice he lay awake many an hour silent and without stirring unwilling to awaken his kind and vigilant nurse he loved his daughter with more fondness now perhaps than ever he had done since the days of her childhood in the discharge of gentle offices and kind filial duties the simple creature shone most especially she walks into the room as silently as a sunbeam mr dobbin thought as he saw her passing in and out from her father's room a cheerful sweetness lighting up her face as she moved to and fro graceful and noiseless when women are brooding over their children or busied in a sick-room who has not seen in their faces those sweet angelic beams of love and pity a secret feud of some years standing was thus healed and with a tacit reconciliation in these last hours and touched by her love and goodness the old man forgot all his grief against her and wrongs which he and his wife had many a long night debated how she had given up everything for her boy how she was careless of her parents in their old age and misfortune the only thought of the child how absurdly and foolishly impiously indeed she took on when george was removed from her old sedley forgot these charges as he was making up his last account and did justice to the gentle and uncomplaining little martyr one night when she stole into his room she found him awake when the broken old man made his confession oh emmy i've been thinking we were very unkind and unjust to you he said and put out his cold and feeble hand to her she knelt down and prayed by his bedside as he did too having still hold of her hand when our turn comes friend may we have such company in our prayers perhaps as he was lying awake then his life may have passed before him his early hopeful struggles his manly successes and prosperity his downfall in his declining years and his present helpless condition no chance of revenge against fortune which had had the better of him neither name nor money to bequeath a spent-out bootless life of defeat and disappointment and the end here which i wonder brother reader is the better lot to die prosperous and famous or poor and disappointed to have and to be forced to yield or to sink out of life having played and lost the game that must be a strange feeling when a day of our life comes and we say to-morrow success or failure won't matter much 
and the sun will rise and all the myriads of mankind go to their work or their pleasure as usual but i shall be out of the turmoil so there came one morning and sunrise when all the world got up and set about its various works and pleasures with the exception of old john sedley who was not to fight with fortune or to hope or scheme any more but to go and take up a quiet and utterly unknown residence in a churchyard at brompton by the side of his old wife major dobbin jos and georgie followed his remains to the grave in a black cloth coach jos came on purpose from the star and garter at richmond whither he retreated after the deplorable event he did not care to remain in the house with the under the circumstances you understand but emmy stayed and did her duty as usual she was bowed down by no especial grief and rather solemn than sorrowful she prayed that her own end might be as calm and painless and thought with trust and reverence of the words which she had heard from her father during his illness indicative of his faith his resignation and his future hope yes i think that will be the better ending of the two after all suppose you are particularly rich and well-to-do and say on that last day i am very rich i am tolerably well known i have lived all my life in the best society and thank heaven come of a most respectable family i have served my king and country with honour i was in parliament for several years where i may say my speeches were listened to and pretty well received i don't owe any man a shilling on the contrary i lent my old college friend jack lazarus fifty pounds for which my executors will not press him i leave my daughters with ten thousand pounds apiece very good portions for girls i bequeath my plate and furniture my house in baker street with a handsome jointure to my widow for her life and my landed property besides money in the funds and my cellar of well-selected wine in baker street to my son i leave twenty pound a year to my valet and i defy any man after i have gone to find anything against my character or suppose on the other hand your swan sings quite a different sort of dirge and you say i am a poor blighted disappointed old fellow and have made an utter failure through life i was not endowed either with brains or with good fortune and i confess that i have committed a hundred mistakes and blunders i own to having forgotten my duty many a time i can't pay what i owe on my last bed i lie utterly helpless and humble and i pray forgiveness for my weakness and throw myself with a contrite heart at the feet of the divine mercy which of these two speeches think you would be the best oration for your own funeral old sedley made the last and in that humble frame of mind and holding by the hand of his daughter life and disappointment and vanity sank away from under him you see said old osborne to george what comes of merit and industry and judicious speculations and that look at me and my banker's account look at your poor grandfather sedley and his failure and yet he was a better man than i was this day twenty years a better man i should say by ten thousand pound beyond these people and mr clapp's family who came over from brompton to pay a visit of condolence not a single soul alive ever cared a penny piece about old john sedley or remembered the existence of such a person when old osborne first heard from his friend colonel buckler as little georgie has already informed us how distinguished an officer major dobbin was he exhibited a great deal of scornful incredulity and expressed his surprise however such a fellow as that should possess either brains or reputation but he heard of the major's fame from various members of his society sir william dobbin had a great opinion of his son and narrated many stories illustrative of the major's learning valour and estimation in the world's opinion finally 
his name appeared in the lists of one or two great parties of the nobility and this circumstance had a prodigious effect upon the old aristocrat of russell square the major's position as guardian to georgie whose possession had been ceded to his grandfather rendered some meetings between the two gentlemen inevitable and it was in one of these that old osborne a keen man of business looking into the major's accounts with his ward and the boy's mother got a hint which staggered him very much and at once pained and pleased him that it was out of william dobbin's own pocket that a part of the fund had been supplied upon which the poor widow and the child had subsisted when pressed upon this point dobbin who could not tell lies blushed and stammered a good deal and finally confessed the marriage he said at which his interlocutor's face grew dark was very much my doing i thought my poor friend had gone so far that retreat from his engagement would have been dishonour to him and death to mrs osborne and i could do no less when she was left without resources than give what money i could spare to maintain her major d mr osborne said looking hard at him and turning very red too you did me a great injury but give me leave to tell you sir you are an honest fellow there's my hand sir though i little thought that my flesh and blood was living on you and the pair shook hands with great confusion on major dobbin's part thus found out in his act of charitable hypocrisy he strove to soften the old man and reconcile him towards his son's memory he was such a noble fellow he said that all of us loved him and would have done anything for him i as a young man in those days was flattered beyond measure by his preference for me and was more pleased to be seen in his company than in that of the commander-in-chief i never saw his equal for pluck and daring and all the qualities of a soldier and dobbin told the old father as many stories as he could remember regarding the gallantry and achievements of his son and georgie is so like him the major added he's so like him that he makes me tremble sometimes the grandfather said on one or two evenings the major came to dine with mr osborne it was during the time of the sickness of mr sedley and as the two sat together in the evening after dinner all their talk was about the departed hero the father boasted about him according to his wont glorifying himself in recounting his son's feats and gallantry but his mood was at any rate better and more charitable than that in which he had been disposed until now to regard the poor fellow and the christian heart of the kind major was pleased at these symptoms of returning peace and goodwill on the second evening old osborne called dobbin william just as he used to do at the time when dobbin and george were boys together and the honest gentleman was pleased by that mark of reconciliation on the next day at breakfast when miss osborne with the asperity of her age and character ventured to make some remark reflecting slightingly upon the major's appearance or behaviour the master of the house interrupted her you would have been glad enough to get him for yourself miss o but them grapes are sour <laughs> major william is a fine feller that he is grandpapa said georgie approvingly and going up close to the old gentleman he took a hold of his large grey whiskers and laughed in his face good-humouredly and kissed him and he told the story at night to his mother who fully agreed with the boy indeed he is she said your dear father always said so he is one of the best and most upright of men dobbin happened to drop in very soon after this conversation which made amelia blush perhaps and the young scapegrace increased the confusion by telling dobbin the other part of the story i say dob he said there's such an uncommon nice girl wants to marry you she's plenty of tin she wears a front and she scolds the servants from morning till night who is it asked dobbin it's aunt o the boy answered grandpapa said so and i say dob how prime it would be to have you for my uncle 
old sedley's quavering voice from the next room at this moment weakly called for amelia and the laughing ended that old osborne's mind was changing was pretty clear he asked george about his uncle sometimes and laughed at the boy's imitation of the way in which jos said god bless my soul and gobbled his soup then he said it's not respectful sir of you yunkers to be imitating of your relations miss o when you go out a-driving to-day leave my card upon mr sedley do you hear there's no quarrel betwixt me and him anyhow the card was returned and jos and the major were asked to dinner to a dinner the most splendid and stupid that perhaps ever mr osborne gave every inch of the family plate was exhibited and the best company was asked mr sedley took down miss o to dinner and she was very gracious to him whereas she hardly spoke to the major who sat apart from her and by the side of mr osborne very timid jos said with great solemnity it was the best turtle soup he had ever tasted in his life and asked mr osborne where he got his madeira it's some of sedley's wine whispered the butler to his master i've had it a long time and paid a good figure for it too mr osborne said aloud to his guest and then whispered to his right-hand neighbour how he had got it at the old chap's sale more than once he asked the major about about mrs george osborne a theme on which the major could be very eloquent when he chose he told mr osborne of her sufferings of her passionate attachment to her husband whose memory she worshipped still of the tender and dutiful manner in which she had supported her parents and given up her boy when it seemed to her her duty to do so you don't know what she endured sir said honest dobbin with a tremor in his voice and i hope and trust you will be reconciled to her if she took your son away from you she gave hers to you and however much you loved your george depend on it she loved hers ten times more by god you are a good fellow sir was all mr osborne said it had never struck him that the widow would feel any pain at parting from the boy or that his having a fine fortune could grieve her a reconciliation was announced as speedy and inevitable and amelia's heart already began to beat at the notion of the awful meeting with george's father it was never however destined to take place old sedley's lingering illness and death supervened after which a meeting was for some time impossible that catastrophe and other events may have worked upon mr osborne he was much shaken of late and aged and his mind was working inwardly he had sent for his lawyers and probably changed something in his will the medical man who looked in pronounced him shaky agitated and talked of a little blood and the seaside but he took neither of these remedies one day when he should have come down to breakfast his servant missing him went into his dressing-room and found him lying at the foot of the dressing-table in a fit miss osborne was apprised the doctors were sent for georgie stopped away from school the bleeders and cuppers came osborne partially regained cognizance but never could speak again though he tried dreadfully once or twice and in four days he died the doctors went down and the undertaker's men went up the stairs and all the shutters were shut towards the garden in russell square bullock rushed from the city in a hurry how much money had he left to that boy not half surely surely share and share alike between the three it was an agitating moment what was it that the poor old man tried once or twice in vain to say i hope it was that he wanted to see amelia and be reconciled before he left the world to one dear and faithful wife of his son it was most likely that for his will showed that the hatred which he had so long cherished had gone out of his heart they found in the pocket of his dressing-gown 
the letter with the great red seal which george had written him from waterloo he had looked at the other papers too relative to his son for the key of the box in which he kept them was also in his pocket and it was found the seals and envelopes had been broken very likely on the night before the seizure when the butler had taken him tea into his study and found him reading in the great red family bible when the will was opened it was found that half the property was left to george and the remainder between the two sisters mr bullock to continue for their joint benefit the affairs of the commercial house or to go out as he thought fit an annuity of five hundred pounds chargeable on george's property was left to his mother the widow of my beloved son george osborne who was to resume the guardianship of the boy major william dobbin my beloved son's friend was appointed executor and as out of his kindness and bounty and with his own private funds he maintained my grandson and my son's widow when they were otherwise without means of support the testator went on to say i hereby thank him heartily for his love and regard for them and beseech him to accept such a sum as may be sufficient to purchase his commission as a lieutenant-colonel or to be disposed of in any way he may think fit when amelia heard that her father-in-law was reconciled to her her heart melted and she was grateful for the fortune left to her but when she heard how georgie was restored to her and knew how and by whom and how it was william's bounty that had supported her in poverty how it was william who gave her her husband and her son oh then she sank on her knees and prayed for blessings on that constant and kind heart she bowed down and humbled herself and kissed the feet as it were of that beautiful and generous affection and gratitude was all that she had to pay back for such admirable devotion and benefits only gratitude if she thought of any other return the image of george stood up out of the grave and said you are mine and mine only now and for ever william knew her feelings had he not passed his whole life in divining them when the nature of mr osborne's will became known to the world it was edifying to remark how mrs george osborne rose in the estimation of the people forming her circle of acquaintance the servants of jos's establishment who used to question her humble orders and say they would ask master whether or not they could obey never thought now of that sort of appeal the cook forgot to sneer at her shabby old gowns which indeed were quite eclipsed by that lady's finery when she was dressed to go to church of a sunday evening the others no longer grumbled at the sound of her bell or delayed to answer the summons the coachman who grumbled that his osses should be brought out and his carriage made into an hospital for that old feller and mrs o drove her with the utmost alacrity now and trembling lest he should be superseded by mr osborne's coachman asked what them there russell square coachmen knew about town and whether they was fit to sit on a box before a lady jos's friends male and female suddenly became interested about emmy and cards of condolence multiplied on her hall table jos himself who had looked on her as a good-natured harmless pauper to whom it was his duty to give victuals and shelter paid her and the rich little boy his nephew the greatest respect was anxious that she should have change and amusement after her troubles and trials poor dear girl and began to appear at the breakfast-table and most particularly to ask how she would like to dispose of the day in her capacity of guardian to georgie she with the consent of the major her fellow trustee begged miss osborne to live in the russell square house as long as ever she chose to dwell there but that lady with thanks declared that she never could think of remaining alone in that melancholy mansion and departed in deep mourning to cheltenham with a couple of her old domestics the rest were liberally paid and dismissed 
the faithful old butler whom mrs osborne proposed to retain resigning and preferring to invest his savings in a public-house where let us hope he was not unprosperous miss osborne not choosing to live in russell square mrs osborne also after consultation declined to occupy the gloomy old mansion there the house was dismantled the rich furniture and effects the awful chandeliers and dreary blank mirrors packed away and hidden the rich rosewood drawing-room suite was muffled in straw the carpets were rolled up and corded the small select library of well-bound books was stowed into two wine-chests and the whole paraphernalia rolled away in several enormous vans to the pantechnicon where they were to lie until georgie's majority and the great heavy dark plate chests went off to messrs stumpy and rowdy to lie in the cellars of those eminent bankers until the same period should arrive one day emmy with george in her hand and clad in deep sables went to visit the deserted mansion which she had not entered since she was a girl the place in front was littered with straw where the vans had been laden and rolled off they went into the great blank rooms the walls of which bore the marks where the pictures and mirrors had hung then they went up the great blank stone staircases into the upper rooms into that where grandpapa died as georgie said in a whisper and then higher still into georgie's own room the boy was still clinging by her side but she thought of another besides him she knew that it had been his father's room as well as his own she went up to one of the open windows one of those at which she used to gaze with a sick heart when the child was first taken from her and thence as she looked out she could see over the trees of russell square the old house in which she herself was born and where she had passed so many happy days of sacred youth they all came back to her the pleasant holidays the kind faces the careless joyful pastimes and the long pains and trials that had since cast her down she thought of these and of the man who had been her constant protector her good genius her sole benefactor her tender and generous friend look here mother said georgie here's a g o scratched on the glass with a diamond i never saw it before i never did it it was your father's room long before you were born george she said and she blushed as she kissed the boy she was very silent as they drove back to richmond where they had taken a temporary house where the smiling lawyers used to come bustling over to see her and we may be sure noted the visit in the bill and where of course there was a room for major dobbin too who rode over frequently having much business to transact on behalf of his little ward georgie at this time was removed from mr veal's on an unlimited holiday and that gentleman was engaged to prepare an inscription for a fine marble slab to be placed up in the foundling under the monument of captain george osborne the female bullock aunt of georgie although despoiled by that little monster of one half of the sum which she expected from her father nevertheless showed her charitableness of spirit by being reconciled to the mother and the boy roehampton is not far from richmond and one day the chariot with the gold bullocks emblazoned on the panels and the flaccid children within drove to amelia's house at richmond and the bullock family made an irruption into the garden where amelia was reading a book jos was in an arbour placidly dipping strawberries into wine and the major in one of his indian jackets was giving a back to georgie who chose to jump over him he went over his head and bounded into the little advance of bullocks with immense black bows in their hats and huge black sashes accompanying their mourning mamma he is just of the age for rosa the fond parent thought and glanced towards that dear child an unwholesome little miss of seven years of age rosa go and kiss your dear cousin mrs frederick said 
don't you know me george i am your aunt i know you well enough george said but i don't like kissing please and he retreated from the obedient caresses of his cousin take me to your dear mamma you droll child mrs frederick said and those ladies accordingly met after an absence of more than fifteen years during emmy's cares and poverty the other had never once thought about coming to see her but now that she was decently prosperous in the world her sister-in-law came to her as a matter of course so did numbers more our old friend miss swartz and her husband came thundering over from hampton court with flaming yellow liveries and was as impetuously fond of amelia as ever miss swartz would have liked her always if she could have seen her one must do her that justice but que voulez-vous in this vast town one has not the time to go and seek one's friends if they drop out of the rank they disappear and we march on without them who is ever missed in vanity fair but so in a word and before the period of grief for mr osborne's death had subsided emmy found herself in the centre of a very genteel circle indeed the members of which could not conceive that anybody belonging to it was not very lucky there was scarce one of the ladies that hadn't a relation a peer though the husband might be a dry salter in the city some of the ladies were very blue and well informed reading mrs somerville and frequenting the royal institution others were severe and evangelical and held by exeter hall emmy it must be owned found herself entirely at a loss in the midst of their clavers and suffered woefully on the one or two occasions on which she was compelled to accept mrs frederick bullock's hospitalities that lady persisted in patronising her and determined most graciously to form her she found amelia's milliners for her and regulated her household and her manners she drove over constantly from roehampton and entertained her friend with faint fashionable fiddle-faddle and feeble court slip-slop jos liked to hear it but the major used to go off growling at the appearance of this woman with her tuppenny gentility he went to sleep under frederick bullock's bald head after dinner at one of the banker's best parties fred was still anxious that the balance of the osborne property should be transferred from stumpy and rowdy's to them and whilst amelia who did not know latin or who wrote the last crack article in the edinburgh and did not in the least deplore or otherwise mr peel's late extraordinary tergiversation on the fatal catholic relief bill sat dumb amongst the ladies in the grand drawing-room looking out upon velvet lawns trim gravel walks and glistening hot-houses she seems good-natured but insipid said mrs rowdy that major seems to be particularly épris she wants ton sadly said mrs hollyock my dear creature you will never be able to form her she is dreadfully ignorant or indifferent said mrs glowry with a voice as if from the grave and a sad shake of the head and turban i asked her if she thought that it was in eighteen thirty six according to mr jowls or in eighteen thirty nine according to mr wapshot that the pope was to fall and she said poor pope i hope not what has he done she is my brother's widow my dear friends mrs frederick replied and as such i think we are all bound to give her every attention and instruction on entering into the world you may fancy there can be no mercenary motives in those whose disappointments are well known that poor dear mrs bullock said rowdy to hollyock as they drove away together she is always scheming and managing she wants mrs osborne's account to be taken from our house to hers and the way in which she coaxes that boy and makes him sit by that blear-eyed little rosa is perfectly ridiculous i wish glowry was choked with her man of sin and her battle of armageddon cried the other 
and the carriage rolled away over Putney Bridge. But this sort of society was too cruelly genteel for Emmy, and all jumped for joy when a foreign tour was proposed. End of chapter 61